Hi, this is Michael Altos. We're continuing our discussion about cardiac physiology, and this is recording part three. We spoke before about ventricular function and factors that affect it. Now we're going to start talking about how we assess ventricular function. One of the fact factors that we want to talk about is the ejection fraction. The ejection fraction is the fraction of blood volume that is ejected from the ventricular chamber during systole. The heart doesn't normally eject 100% of its contents with each beat. It only ejects a fraction. And this is a common measure of systolic function. Simply, it's the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume, so how much is ejected, divided by the starting end diastolic volume. And a normal EF is usually in the range of 50 to 75 percent. How is this measured? Most commonly with echocardiography, where they look at the heart in systole and in diastole and measure the size of the ventricular chamber to determine how much blood has been injected. It can also be done in the cath lab. The next very important concept that we're going to discuss is the volume pressure diagram. This diagram shows the left ventricular volume on the x-axis and the left intraventricular pressure, the pressure in the ventricle, on the y-axis. And we're going to walk through all of the steps of the cardiac cycle, sort of like we did before when we looked at a different diagram. Starting at point A, we have what we call filling, specifically diastolic filling. The heart fills from a low volume to a high volume once the mitral valve opens, and blood can pour in from the atrium. Here we see a little bit of a bump in pressure. That's probably that little atrial kick when the atrium contracts and adds just a little bit more volume and a little bit more pressure. The end diastolic volume is at point B. At that point, the mitral valve has closed and no more volume can come into the heart. Now systole begins, and that is contraction of the ventricle. But the aortic valve is still closed, and so while the heart is contracting, it's not ejecting any blood. So volume doesn't change, but pressure goes up. We call this isovolumic contraction. This continues with pressures increasing until the aortic valve finally opens. At that point, pressure still increases, but blood is now ejecting out of the heart, and so ventricular volume decreases again as blood leaves the heart through the aortic valve. This finally continues until the aortic valve closes at the end of systole. Now we are in diastole, and with the aortic valve closed, but the mitral valve is still closed, pressures rapidly drop in the left ventricle. The left ventricle is relaxing, the volume of the chamber is in, trying to increase, but no blood is able to come in yet. This is isovolumic relaxation, where the volume doesn't change, but pressures drop. And this continues until pressures become low enough that the mitral valve can open. This is, and this is when blood can start to fill the ventricle again. So we've seen the four components of the cardiac cycle. We see stroke volume as being the difference between full and empty, or the lowest volume. And we can see how the pressures change during the cardiac cycle. Incidentally, the area of this fig of this curve, the area of the area inside this curve is called the uh, um, the work that's done by the ventricle. Let's look at a few more curves that describe the cardiac cycle. So, for example, we have the end systolic point. We saw that going back. Here's systole. And here's our end systolic point when the heart is finished contracting. So our end systolic point is the same as long as a patient's contractility stays the same. Here's our end systolic point right over here on another pressure, on another pressure volume curve. What we're going to see is as we look at different contractile states, we'll see lots of different pressure volume curves, but their end systolic point will always lie on this same line. In fact, the pressure volume loop can't cross this line because it actually defines the maximum pressure that can be generated 
for a given inotropic state, that is for a given contractility. So unless you change your contractility, your pressure volume loop is unable to cross this line, which we call the end systolic pressure volume relationship. So that's our end systolic point. We also have an end diastolic point. This is the point when the heart is filled and is ready to start contracting. This is called the end diastolic pressure volume relationship. And this really defines elastance. Elastance is kind of the inverse of compliance. It's how stretchy the heart is. Obviously, a stretchier heart will be able to accommodate more volume at a given pressure. We're going to start looking at some of uh, how these curves change under different states because ventricular volume pressure diagrams can be used to show the effects of just changing one variable. What happens if we just change preload or just afterload or just contractility? Let's explore this a little bit and see what happens. We're going to start by looking at changes in preload. So we're not going to change contractility. We're not going to change afterload. We're just going to change preload. And we know that this is a little bit theoretical because in the body, everything is sort of interrelated. But right now we're going to focus on just one variable at a time and see what kind of an impact it has on the way the heart works. So we've increased preload. And we know preload is venous return. So more blood is returning to the heart. That's an increased end diastolic volume. So we've gone from, here's our control in gray, and now our pink or red curve has an increased end diastolic volume. There's more blood in the heart at the end of filling, at the end of diastole. So the ventricle stretches and it can eject more blood and it has an increased stroke volume and it can do that without increasing its pressures. And since the um, this side of the curve doesn't change, the heart still ejects to the same end systolic volume, right? We're still limited by this curve over here. So what we actually have is a wider curve. It has a larger area inside, which means it's doing more work. So we see that cardiac output has actually increased to compensate for increased preload. And this happened without changing contractility. The heart didn't get more efficient or stronger. This is the Frank Starling mechanism showing that as I increase ventricular filling, we're able to eject more blood at the same pressure and get an increased cardiac output. The same is true in the other direction if we decrease preload, so we have less ventricular filling. So then the ventricle stretches less and actually is able to eject less blood, again returning to the same end systolic point. Ventricular work is less and cardiac output decreases. So this is the effect of just changing preload. What happens instead if we just change afterload and we keep preload and contractility constant? So increased afterload means we're pumping against a higher aortic pressure. Either we're um, pinching off the aortic uh, artery or we are pinching off the aortic valve or something like that. So that means the ventricle has to generate higher pressure in order to eject its contents. Here we see the control curve. And now as I increase afterload, the heart starts with the same amount of blood in it. But now to get the blood out, it has to generate more pressure than it did before in order to eject that blood. And as a result, not as much blood can leave the heart. So our end systolic volume is actually a little bit higher than it was before. Our ejection fraction goes down. The heart can't eject as much blood because it's pumping against a higher pressure. Now this relationship between end systolic volume and pressure is preserved, right? Contractility is unchanged. And like we said before, for any contractility, all end systolic pressures lie on the same line. They have the same relationship. On the other hand, let's say we have a patient and we are able to open up their aortic uh, valve and decrease their afterload, um, or we give a vasodilator that decreases afterload. So in that case, again, we have the same ventricular filling, but now we're able to pump out all of our blood with less pressure. In fact, so much less pressure that we can get a little bit more blood out than we were able to before. As a result, our ejection fraction has actually gone up, and our ejection pressures have gone down. Finally, let's look at changes in contractility. So now preload and afterload are being held constant, but we're going to change contractility. This might be done during exercise, or if you give some sort of a sympathetic drug like um, digoxin or epinephrine. So the heart pumps stronger. It has an increased rate of pressure development, increased ejection velocity. The heart can generate higher pressures and it can eject more volume.
So here's our gray curve, which is the control. We still have the same amount of ventricular filling, right? Preload hasn't changed. But now when the heart pumps, it can pump a little bit more pressure. Sorry, I'm, I'm pointing to the wrong curve here. We're looking at the red curve. So it can pump with using a little bit less pressure. But because the heart is efficient, what we mainly see is that this relationship between pressure and volume is now allowed to change. And the heart can actually eject more volume at a given pressure and the heart can become more empty. Our ejection fraction increases and the slope of this line has become steeper. Whereas a patient whose contractility is reduced, they have decreased inotropy, they actually need to generate uh, the same amount of pressure in order to get less ejection fraction because the heart is weaker. So we've talked about uh, systolic function quite a bit here. We've talked about afterload, preload, contractility, how they affect ejection fraction. These are all systolic um, parameters. We haven't really talked about diastole at all, and we will in a few minutes talk about diastolic function and dysfunction. For now, I just want to say that diastolic function talks about the ability of the heart to relax and to fill, which is something we measure almost exclusively with echocardiography. And again, we'll talk about that more a little bit later in the recordings. Now, patients can have inappropriately high or low cardiac outputs. So cardiac output can be inappropriately high if your peripheral vascular resistance is low. A patient who has something called an arterial venous shunt, which is any direct connection between a large artery and a large vein, so that kind of bypasses the organs and the resistance that's in there. And as a result, we have decreased resistance, increased venous return, and increased cardiac output. Hyperthyroidism is another example of high cardiac output. In these patients, their tissue metabolism is greatly increased. They are using oxygen very quickly, and so their tissues start to release vasodilators in order to increase blood flow. Peripheral resistance decreases, venous return increases, and once again, cardiac output increases. Anemic patients also can have pathologically high cardiac output. As the concentration of red blood cells decreases, a couple things happen. First of all, that decreased amount of red blood cells in the blood decreases the viscosity of the blood. It's actually a little bit thinner, and so the blood can flow more easily, and this is, gives the effect of a decreased resistance. Also, when oxygen delivery to tissues is decreased, if it's diminished, the tissues vasodilate, as we just said a moment ago, and this also will lead to increased venous return and increased cardiac output. Patients can also have low cardiac output for a variety of reasons. One common reason is due to decreased effectiveness of their cardiac pump. So if the heart is starting to fail, their cardiac output will go, go down. One of the best examples is a heart attack. If a patient has blockage of their coronary vessels, they have a myocardial infarction, which means part of the heart is ischemic and not getting enough oxygen, so then the pump stops working, and that would be a good reason to have low cardiac output. But many other parts of the heart can have problems leading to low cardiac output. Severe valvular disease, as we discussed earlier. Myocarditis, which is a viral infection of the heart muscle. Cardiac tamponade or pericardial effusion. The heart is surrounded by a sac called the pericardium. Normally it has very little fluid in it between 15 and 50 mils, and it really just lubricates the cardiac movement within the chest cavity. But if blood or fluid accumulates in this sac, then the heart can't expand as much as it wants to because it's pushing against this bag of fluid that's pushing back in. And we call that tamponade physiology, and that can happen in patients who've had trauma or cancer or infection. Um, similarly, if you have pericarditis where this, um, where this membrane is kind of stiff and doesn't allow the heart to expand, once again, cardiac output can be decreased. Patients who have tamponade physiology have something called pulsus paradoxus. That means that they have a decreased systolic blood pressure that drops during inspiration, because inspiration um, decreases their venous return, and so the forces of the pericardial tamponade pushing on the ventricle exceed the filling of the ventricle. And so we see big differences in systolic blood pressure during inspiration compared to during expiration. When we do anesthesia for patients who have tamponade physiology, 
One of the things we want to do is avoid giving them any peripheral vasodilators or anything that depresses their my myocardium. This can lead to hypotension that could really kill them. These patients need to maintain their heart rate, usually they're tachycardic. Since we can see that their stroke volume is going to be low because their ventricular filling is pretty low, the only way they can maintain cardiac output is through heart rate. Stroke volume, they can't really adjust very much. They need that heart rate. And if you give them a drug that drops their heart rate, they could really go into heart failure and have inadequate cardiac output and go into shock. Many people will use ketamine as an induction drug for this reason, because ketamine actually increases heart rate. Once you correct the tamponade, you may see hypertension um, after the tamponade problem has been resolved. Patients can also have low cardiac output for reasons that don't involve the heart itself. For example, if they have decreased venous return. So patients who are bleeding or hypovolemic. If a patient has an acute venous dilation, which we see during fainting, or if one of their large veins becomes obstructed. That can happen during a pneumothorax or a mediastinal mass. Or as patients decrease their tissue mass or their metabolic rate, so patients who age or are on bed rest who have hypothyroidism, all of these factors lead to decreased venous return. And as we saw, decreased venous return means decreased preload and decreased cardiac output. So how do we actually measure cardiac output? We know that cardiac output is stroke volume times, times um, heart rate, and we can measure heart rate easily, but ejection fraction can be kind of hard to measure unless you have an echo probe. It turns out there are a few other ways of measuring cardiac output. One of them is called the oxygen fic method. In this method, we want to measure the concentration of oxygen in the blood both before and after it passes through the lungs. How do we do that? Well, if we put a pulmonary artery catheter through the venous side, we can measure pulmonary artery mixed venous blood. That's blood before it goes to the lungs. And then blood after it goes through the lungs doesn't really lose any oxygen until it gets to tissue. So you could just take any arterial uh, line or any arterial stick and take blood from there, and that would be blood after it passes through the lungs. We can measure how much oxygen the lungs are uh, absorbing we can do that with an oxygen meter. So we can look at air before it goes into the lungs and after it leaves the lungs and see how much oxygen is being absorbed. And then cardiac output can be measured as pulmonary oxygen absorption divided by the arteriovenous oxygen difference. So this is called the oxygen FIC method, one well-established way to measure cardiac output. Another way would be with some sort of an indicator. We could in inject an indicator dye into the right atrium through a central line. And then at some other point, we could measure the concentration, and that will give us an idea of how efficiently the heart is pumping. One of the methods that you're most likely to see in the cardiac surgery rooms is the thermodilution method. In this setup, we use a pulmonary artery catheter. We inject cold saline of a known volume into the right atrium, and pulmonary artery catheters have a temperature probe at the tip. So we measure how blood temperature changes, first from body temperature, then it becomes cold as this cold saline touches the tip, and then it gradually warms up again as blood continues to pump through the heart. By measuring this change in blood temperature as a function of time, we can actually calculate cardiac output. And then, of course, one of the best ways is echocardiography, where we can take detailed measurements of heart chambers and look at blood velocities flowing into the aorta. We can look at aortic cross-sectional um, area and use those measurements to actually calculate cardiac output. We'll stop here. If you have any questions, please do let me know, and we will meet up with you again in the next recording.